Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aaron Goins. Welcome to the Last Line of Fence Real Estate Meetup. I'm your host. And uh, the reason why I started this meetup is because when I was in the military, no one talked about real estate in my circles. Uh, a lot of times when people deploy in the military, you see a lot more dog charges and pickup trucks on the road instead of appreciating value items. So I want to start a meetup that I can teach people the benefits of real estate so that they can build generational wealth for not only themselves, but their families. Today, I'm very, very excited for our guest speaker, uh, Mr. Yona Weiss. Um, but before I get to Yona, um, do you have anybody new on here? And looks like Mr. Mark Rito. How you doing, sir? Can you introduce yourself to everybody, please? Unmute. Yeah, can you guys see me? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm uh, Mark Riddell. Uh, I am in Auburn, Washington. So I got introduced uh, to Aaron through Ellison. So we're kind of in the same rank group. So it's a pleasure to meet all you guys. And um, so like Aaron, you know, real estate wasn't in my family's background. So trying to change that for my family and then um, just kind of still learning. Um, still intimated into talk, you know, talking with people sometimes about real estate because it's just not natural in a sense for my cultural background. So by just meeting you guys and learning, hopefully that'll get better. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And um, just um, joining this meetup right here and joining Ring, man, is a great, great start. Um, and uh, if you need anything, please let me know. But uh, I think you enjoy the networking. And um, as you go along, man, uh, you know, just network away and you'll meet a lot of good people and um, have future deals in, in place. Uh, I don't like no one else is new on here, uh, but um, let's get started with our guest speaker. Um, I'm very, very excited. Um, our guest speaker uh, hosts um, his own podcast called The Weiss of Ice. Um, he also has a, a great meetup on Wednesdays that I attend regularly. Um, great networking on there. Um, Mr. Yona Weiss has a lot of experience uh, with tax strategies and, and different entities like that. I'm not going to steal his thunder for him, but I don't want, I want you to introduce Mr. Yona Weiss. Thank you very much, Aaron. It's a pleasure to uh, be here and to be joining you guys tonight. Sorry about the, the little tardiness over here, but um, yeah, I'm glad to be here and hope we can learn a lot. Aaron, you want me to just take it away? Or you, you got some more? Oh well, I'm sorry. Um, I mean, this. Uh, I mean, you can present if you want to, or you can have a Q and A session. It's up to you what you want to do. Uh, you tell me. What do you think is the best? I do have a presentation. I think you saw you saw it uh, a few weeks back when I presented that. I'm happy to do it again for this group, and there, you know, hopefully get a lot from that. Otherwise, I'm happy to just do a little Q and A. But you tell me. All right, let's, uh, I think everybody except for Claudia heard your presentation and, and Jasmine heard your presentation, right? Right, Kenneth? I think everybody's heard your presentation is a very good one. Um, so I'm gonna do something different today. Let's let's have the studio, let's have the, um, have the attendees ask you questions. I'm gonna ask you questions as well. And just, sure. and just, just, do, it, just do it like that. A lot of times we have presentation, but like I said, you've done it a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Asking. And um, if anybody uh, wants to hear it, please uh, go to his uh, his his uh, YouTube, his um, and his Facebook page, and you will see a great presentation by Yona. So um, let me let me let me ask anybody, Ken, if you got any questions for Yona. I have some, but uh, more later on. Like you could uh, okay. pass later on. Yeah, maybe I'll just give a little a little background, a little brief introduction, what cost segregation is, what we do, and um, and we can kind of use that as a as a springboard. That sound good? Sure. All right, perfect. So uh, as you said, a lot of you probably heard the presentation. Happy to go through the details, but essentially, what cost segregation is, it's a, a very oh, you know oftentimes overlooked real estate strategy. Essentially, what it is is it is a strategy to accelerate depreciation on your property. So that allows you to take 
bigger tax deductions than you would normally take when you're investing in real estate. And when you hear about investing in real estate, and one of the benefits is the tax benefits. So what they're talking about mostly, I mean, there's obviously mortgage expense and there are 1031 exchanges and there's so many different things at that. But essentially, the biggest thing is depreciation, which is a tax income tax deduction you get just because you bought a property. Okay, and that's based on your purchase price and it's divided up over a long period of time. So 29, 27 and a half year period for residential or 39 year period for commercial. What we do is by segregating that cost, essentially what we're doing is breaking down the building, dissecting the building into different components and saying, showing how certain things actually depreciate on a faster rate. So what we're able to do by doing that is, is allow an investor to get bigger tax deductions in those earlier years. So when you want to make money and not have to pay taxes on it, that's what this is. This method is for, right? I mean, there's really almost no other investment vehicle out there where you can get the returns on that investment and also not have to pay taxes on it. So it's, it's something really interesting about it is that even though uh, this is an awesome strategy, but it's something that the IRS says is the proper way to depreciate your property, meaning you're supposed to break down the building into these different components and depreciate each one separately, right? On five-year schedules, seven-year, 15-year schedules, and not just put everything lumped together on that 27 and a half or 39-year schedule, but they don't require you to do it, okay? Which is a really interesting thing. I mean, you would think, you know, you're, you have to do it properly. If you actually, are just taking what's called straight line depreciation and taking that deduction over a 39 year period, you're, according to the IRS, you're actually doing it wrong, right? It's the improper way of, of counting your taxes, but they're never gonna tell you and they're not gonna, you're not gonna be penalized ever for doing it that way. But if you wanna change that and you've you know, owned a property for a year or a number of years and have been just doing straight line depreciation on that method, by lumping everything together. Uh, if you wanna change that, and now starting this year, going forward, do a cost segregation and put it, everything in the proper way, you actually file a form with the IRS called the 3115 form. It's a change of accounting method and get this, there's a box you check there that says, you're changing your method from an improper way to a proper way. So you're actually doing it the right way by doing the cost segregation. But again, they're not gonna go out of their way to tell you you need to do this because their interest is really getting people to pay more taxes. And so I think this goes back to the general uh, principle that uh, you know taxes are an incentive program, okay? It's not what a lot of people think that it's just uh, penalties. The tax code is written to incentivize people for doing certain activities. And I learned this first from uh, Tom Wheelwright book, Tax-Free Wealth, if you guys haven't read that, definitely check that out. Um, and he, he basically says there, so real estate investors get a huge tax benefit because they're, you know, providing jobs, they're providing homes, you know, so many things. So it is a little bit strange that now, you know, legislation is trying to, you know, reverse that and penalize real estate investors. That's, that's a whole different discussion. Anyways, um, having to answer any questions, I think that's a good background to understanding that uh, it's it's a pretty straightforward process in getting this uh, cost segregation study done uh, and really is for anyone, any type of property. I mean, it used to be just relegated to huge commercial buildings, you know, tens of millions of dollars. But nowadays it's really cost effective even for single families, even for smaller properties. And it, it can be something that you can get done uh, at any time. So, yeah, Mark. Yeah, so you own a... Uh... Thanks. Um, so yeah, I did ask my CPA. Um, so I I initially just started with turnkey property. So where the turnkey provider already fixed it up and I just had to come up with the financing. And I did hear about cost segregation from Tom Wilbright. And when I asked my CPA, it was like, is there a way can do cost segregation on future purchases? And then I told him, you know, I'm kind of just looking at 100K and under wasn't really looking to fix it up because I'm out of state because that was kind of before I, I had maybe a team in that area. <clears throat> so, and then I, it seems like these mostly cost segregation projects are for, like you said, bigger, um, bigger projects or bigger buildings. So 
and I know there is companies out there that can do cost segregation for you. So is there a kind of a balance on what you can kind of tell us for the type of property to look at for, or just, you know, do we look at a property to have more rehab work done to more effectively use cost segregation or? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. There's, so really the cost segregation is done on the acquisition of the property, okay? And it can be done on the rehab also, but they're two separate things. When you buy a property, your depreciation schedule is based on that purchase price. However much the property was, was purchased for, you subtract a certain amount for land and that's what you're left with. So when understanding when is it gonna be um, beneficial is, is really, it's a percentage of the purchase price. And so it's proportionate to how much um, of that property that you can accelerate. So typically speaking for single families, you're talking turnkey, like single family rentals. Right, yeah. You usually, and it does depend on the, you know, the type of single family. Sometimes some are, are bigger than others. Some have more landscaping and things which are 15 year property can, it can be well, some are more luxury. Um, you know, I've got a lot of clients that are doing short-term rentals, Airbnbs, very luxuriously, um, you know, built out, uh, you know, top quality, uh, you know, furnishings and all kinds of stuff. So that five-year property is going to be more, it's going to contribute more to the faster depreciation. But typically speaking, you're looking at about a 15 to 20% of the purchase price or of the tax basis really that you can accelerate. So without getting too deep into the numbers, and we always run like a free analysis for any property. So you can see exactly what the numbers would be for that property. But if you just think of it like this, per hundred thousand dollars, Okay, if you're getting 15 to 20 percent, let's say you know 15 to 20 thousand dollars of accelerated depreciation per hundred thousand dollars of investment uh, of purchase price or of tax basis. So if you got to pay a couple thousand dollars to get it done, and usually for single families we charge a bit less than than commercial or multifamily properties because there's just less work on our part to do. Uh, but even uh, 1,500, 2,000 dollars or so we would charge. Is that worth it, right? To pay 1500 $1, bucks to get $20,000 of tax deductions, you got to see what's your after-tax benefit. So $100,000 property, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it unless the person really needed it. Um, you know, someone reached out to me a few weeks ago and was like, my CPA said, if I can pay $4,000 to get $20,000 of deductions, it's worth it. I'm like, okay, buddy, I'm not going to tell you to do it. But if your CPA said it's worth it for you, for him, that was like, you know, it's an after-tax benefit, a high tax bracket, after-tax benefit of about, you know, seven, eight thousand dollars Well, and, and, you know, he used it 4000 as a tax write-off. So he figured that all out. He's like, okay, I'm going to get, uh, it's worth it for me. Okay. Again, everyone is, has their, uh, their preference. I'm always going to be interested in what each individual person, you know, what's their business plan? Is it going to be worthwhile? Um, and I wouldn't recommend it otherwise. Aaron, what do you got for us? Um, so Ellison asked a question, what's the difference between cost segregation and appreciation? Uh, so cost segregation is just a advanced form of depreciation. It's the same thing. So depreciation, uh, you know, it's not, don't think of it the definition, it's a tax deduction, right? Which is based on the principle of things go down in value. And so your depreciation deduction allows you to take the entire building after land, which does not depreciate as a tax write-off over a certain number of years. So typically speaking, regular depreciation, what people think of as regular depreciation is you just lump together on a 27 and a half year schedule and take a little bit every single year. So it's about two to 3% of your you know, property. That's your tax deduction each year. Okay. That's what depreciation is. Cost segregation is just an advanced form of that. It's really just breaking down things that the IRS says personal property depreciates on a five-year schedule. And so stuff like appliances and furniture and even carpeting cabinets, things that are in the building that are non-structural and a lot more things, just examples, all of that actually depreciates on a five-year schedule. So you should be taking the tax write-off, right? Those, those deductions over a five-year period. Okay. So that's what cost segregation is. It's, it's, it's not something different than depreciation. It's just a way of breaking that depreciation down. And it used to be called before the IRS kind of took over this term. Um, the IRS didn't coin the term cost segregation, believe it or not. It actually came up from, from some accounting firms uh, and then they took it on, they adopted it, but it used to be called component depreciation. 
that was a tax terminology, which makes a lot more sense. And so I don't know why they call it cost segregation. It's maybe to confuse people. I think that if you're right, like, I don't know, shy people away, like, don't do this. It's segregation. Like, I don't know. I have no idea why they, they call it that eventually. Anyways, that's the, that's the long and the short. So how long would this process take to, to uh, get it to look at? So we, like I said, we always do like a free estimate ahead of time. It takes a day or two to turn around, but then the actual report itself, um, our timeline is about six to eight weeks. We can definitely get it done uh, much faster, but it just has to do with our, our business and our whole uh, pipeline of work. We have a, a team of about 50 people, five zero, but we, we do about 3000 of these projects a year uh, across the country. So it's just a matter of, uh, you know, moving things down from one team to the next to, to get it done. Um, yeah. Are we ready for a Kenneth's, uh, Kenneth's? Oh, maybe on uh, one. I, I'm, I was trying to read up on this and I'm still puzzled about one thing. Say it, I got to do a cost or bonus integration on certain components within the structure. Then I do a major CapEx. I have a major CapEx plan in five years. Can I depreciate or cost integrate the same structural item, say roof? Uh, appliances, stuff like that. Again, like the same roof in, in the same building. If I do, I do. If I do major capex in my whole period, you cannot. You can't depreciate the same item twice. But if you replace the roof, then that's not the same item. That that roof that's been replaced has been removed. Right? You've taken that off the books. And actually, there's something called partial asset disposition, which is only something uh, to look into, which allows you to write off the remaining value of that old roof or that old, you know, those old appliances or whatever it is that you were removing, uh, you take that off. You can actually take it as a write-off. So that comes down from your depreciation schedule and the money spent on the CapEx will now be put on your depreciation schedule uh, starting at the point that that's placed in service. So if you put in a, um, you know, bought the building in 2020 and then in 2022, put in a new roof. So that new roof, Again, that's structural. It's on a 27 and a half year schedule, but that can now be depreciated starting in 2022 at that time. And so too with, with any type of CapEx. I mean, what we do is, um, you know, a lot of times we'll do CapEx uh, renovations. It's called a renovations study, we call it. So it's like a supplemental thing to the actual cost irrigation. Once you've done the acquisition, you know how much everything is, you know, every individual asset, the line item, what it's worth, what its value is. Then when you go ahead a year later or so and replace stuff, you put in new appliances, you put in new carpeting, you put in whatever it is you're doing, pave the parking lot, that new value can now be cost area. You can now take that as, um, you know, faster depreciation or bonus depreciation, as you mentioned. So say I have, I'm sorry, I'm taking a whole thing, like a major overhaul of a building, say like in Mark's uh, situation, like they're doing a Hulk. Can I take the regular 27 and a half, depreciation like year one, year two, and after all my renovations is done in year two, do the cost segregation and break it down my components then? Is that more, because I have not taken down the individual components, I did the whole structure over the first two years. And then mm -hmm. after like all my major CapEx, all the improvements, then uh, then then, then get it, would you have to get it reappraised? How would you get your new base value then? <laughs> So it's not re, it's not reappraisal. The, the the depreciation is based solely on how much money was put into the property. Um, so it doesn't change with the new appraisal. But what will happen is if you spend a million dollars on the capex, for example, that that money spent should now be broken down into those different components and depreciated, based starting on the day when that those renovations are finished. So to answer your first question, if you bought a property a couple of years ago and never did cost segregation you can now this year or in any future year when you decide to go back and retroactively set up cost segregation going forward. So from this year and say, I wanna do it now, you can go forward and actually catch up whatever, you're know, putting everything retroactively on those proper schedules, five year, 15 year, 27 year schedule, and now catch up whatever accelerated depreciation you missed in previous years. So that's something you can do going forward. On the, like you said, on the renovations, that's really a second step and that should it's it's done separately because those assets are on a different schedule, right? They are placed in service later on. So this depreciation starts at a later point. Does that make sense? 
That's clear. Okay. I see some other confused faces here. So if I'm, if I'm uh, not clear on something, please let me know. And if you, anyone has any questions, um, this is the time. So uh, that's is... just uh, like, uh, my question is, let's say you buy a multifamily and it's, so it's brand new to you. How do you mm -hmm. determine the, the cost segregation when you just start off? Yeah, that's a great question. So cost segregation is um, you know, depreciation in general and cost segregation specifically starts the day you buy the property or the day you place the property in service. So it's new to you. And so that 27 and a half years starts over brand new with each new, um, with each new owner. Okay. And it's based on the purchase price on how much they paid for it. So that's when you, uh, that's when you begin the cost segregation at that point or the depreciation. So uh, after you do the, the cost segregation in five years deadline, you want to rent a property. So mm -hmm. whatever we do, start the cost segregation over de depending on how much we spend. Is that, is that correct? I'm not sure I heard every word. It was breaking up a little bit. Uh, but if I understood you correctly, you're asking if you bought the property and then several years later you did renovations, um, at what point would you do the cost segregation? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Right. So, yeah. um, yeah, so the acquisition, right? Your depreciation on the whole building and the whole property starts the day you buy it, okay? And, and that's gonna be based on the purchase price, okay? When you do renovations at a later point, years down the road, you can now capitalize and depreciate or the amount spent later on. So if, you know, five years down the road, you did a major, major renovations and you, sent, you spent a million dollars, let's say, that million dollars will now be depreciated as well, starting when those renovations are, are finished. And that will be added to your basis. Okay, so it will be overall, it will be cumulative. Wow. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure. I have a question about how you guys do it. You said, um, you, 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 I guess, across the country, do you fly out? locations to do the, to do the cost segregations or do you guys do it virtually? Yeah, so, um, you know, the IRS requires the engineering component to it. So it, even though it's a tax strategy, um, in order to do the cost segregation, you have to actually have an engineer who's trained in the tax code to identify all these different pieces. So that's how we're doing it. It's, um, it's not, you know, accountants coming. So we actually do have engineers across the country um, who work for us in-house. But and so our traditional method of, of operation was having a site visit, right? Everywhere and traveling, our engineers traveling, crisscrossing around the country. Uh, but since the pandemic really came about, we had to pivot really quickly. We have, like I said, we do about three thousand meetings a year. And so back in March, April time, when people saying, "Well, we need to get this done. How are we going to do it?" There's travel bans, right? So we adopted a, a virtual. Uh, method which allowed our engineers with the help of someone on site so a property manager or a tenant or a maintenance person someone who has access to just take a video call with that engineer and and show them around and basically uh, take all the data that they would have as if they were there you know kind of focus zoom in here right take uh, you know this what's the measure this and uh, and we're able to do that really well so since last um, you know almost a year now we've done uh, a couple thousand of these virtually. And it's been it's been really it's been really great. So we still do the uh, you know on-site tours when necessary, especially more complex type of properties. We still need our engineers uh, to get in there, especially like large office buildings or large retail centers where you need to go into literally every suite or every unit. It's a lot more time-consuming, and each one is different. Whereas a multifamily building. Uh, traditionally, uh, according to the IRS, you only need to go into one of each unit type. Um, so if you have, you know, a 150 unit building, but you only have three different unit layouts. Uh, so you really just need to go into each one of one of each, and then you can use um, that data uh, and just multiply them across the rest. Any more questions? 
He's here. Please ask. Yes, I do have a question. It's Jasmine. Um, so you mentioned that when you purchase the properties, when that time starts, my question is, and it may be a technicality, but I feel like um, when it comes to IRS, a lot of it are based on technicalities anyway. Mm -hmm. I own a property. Um, I uh, then do, essentially my LLC is now the owner of the property. Does that count as a new owner technically in this case, or is it still me or does it does it depend on how the LLC maybe is structured? Um, can you give more insight? Yeah, so are you saying that you, you own a property and then basically transferred ownership into an LLC at a later point? Is that weird? Yes. Yeah, so if you are just transferring ownership, um, that's called a non arm's length transaction. And so therefore it's, you're not actually changing ownership. The depreciation doesn't start over as it would with an arm's length transaction selling to a totally different uh, person. So just transferring from yourself to yourself, um, the depreciation doesn't start over. It, it's gonna start when the original purchase was. Got it, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Boy, Mr. International. Hey, everybody, how you doing? Hey, Yona, how you doing today? Uh, thank you. This is great uh, information. Um, you where can I get one of those hats? Said. Lawrence, where can I get an MTA hat? <laughs> I'll get you one. I'll get you one. <laughs> <laughs> um, you said before that you can, you can also do um, just not commercial, you can do residential also? Yeah, any type of property, as long as it's not your personal residence, okay? Your personal residence, you do not um, get the depreciation deduction for. So second question. So this past, just the beginning of this year, I got a new roof placed yeah. on my property, all right? Oh, the complete new roof. So now what would, I have, what would I have to do if I wanted to get, get a cost segregation? Would that be worth it? Um, for the new roof, you don't need a cost segregation done because again, the, the the roof is structural, and so but mm -hmm. you would you would add that to your to your depreciation schedule, so that should right. be added to the basis and depreciated. Right for twenty two. Okay, all right. Thank you. No problem. Hey, you know, is there any considerations when you have like non revenue pieces in your in your property? Say like a club, like a big apartment building, a clubhouse. Can you do? Cost segregation there, or if you have like a just like a in a in a smaller one like a laundry facility or something like that, a lot of revenue. But how can you still cost yeah. segregate like playgrounds and like amenities and stuff like that that are not revenue? Yeah, absolutely. Meaning uh, any everything and anything that's on your property is depreciated, and so every every individual thing has a depreciation schedule, and that's really the job of the engineer to come and identify what those things are and what schedule that goes on. So playground equipment, for example, depreciates on a 15-year schedule. It's considered land improvements, even though, like, what does that have to do with land improvements? Uh, it's still part of the, you know, it was included in the entire purchase, right? So to a clubhouse or a laundry room, et cetera, all that stuff is included. And so the job of the cost segregation is basically to dissect the property and say, okay, I bought this huge property and, and in it is all these different individual components, right? And so that's how we're breaking it down and seeing how each thing depreciates separately. So some things are structural, right? Some things are going to be, um, you know, on a 27 and a half year structural schedule, right? Doors, windows, roof, walls, all that stuff is structural, main plumbing and electrical. And so we're identifying that as well and, uh, you know, assigning a value to everything uh, individually. So it doesn't have to be a revenue producing asset as long as included in the overall uh, business or rental property. Yeah, this is great. This is like the, the, the this is the advanced, the advanced class. <laughs> One more question, uh, Yona. Um, yeah. When when was when should somebody call? Let's say they somebody wants to hire you to do this cost segregation. What is the time? What is the time? What, what when should they be calling you? Um, you can call me anytime, Lawrence. You you got my number. You can call me anytime. But uh, but seriously. We're the best time is, you know, I, I find that people like to get an idea uh, as soon as possible after acquisition. 
um, which, you know, even if you're under contract on something, you can reach out and we can do that free analysis. Like I mentioned, we will provide a free analysis ahead of time. So you can know even if it's worthwhile and what it will, uh, what it will look like to get the conservation study done. So that's something that uh, a lot of people like to get done in the first year. So get your taxes set up the right to you know, from the beginning. However, it can be done at any time and each situation is going to be different. If you have a property that is just not, um, not making any money, maybe you're doing major, uh, you know, a gut renovation that first year, there's no income and you don't have mm -hmm. other income. It doesn't make sense to get the conservation done in that first year necessarily uh, because you're just going to create these passive losses. It'll carry forward. Of course, you know, you can use them in the future, but it may not necessarily make sense right at the beginning. So that's something you know, you can't get, the luxury is that you can do this uh, retroactively. You can do this um, on properties that you've owned for, for a number of years. So really the, the answer is, it depends. I would say if, if it's something that you have an idea that's gonna be producing income and, and you wanna know and wanna get it done, the sooner the better to reach out. Thank you. Yeah, because like I said, it does take about six to eight weeks for us to complete this. And, and you need to get it done before you file your taxes. So if you bought a property in 2020, for example, and you haven't filed your 2020 taxes yet, by the way, I just heard the personal income tax got pushed uh, a month back to May. So you have an extra month to do that. You can still get it done. If you file an extension, you still have till the fall. Um, and if you're finally, you know, bought a property this year in 2021, you have until, you know, next March to get it done. Um, so it's not something that needs to be done right away. But again, you never want to wait till the last minute. Uh, okay. Going along with that, like getting it done, you know, this is more of a political question. I don't know if you want to touch it, but with all like the the like the new changes, like I talk about changing the tax code, like 1031s might be on the block. Um, and they mentioned like the, all the bonus depreciation you could take. Do you see this going away? And then if it does go away, if we're already in a cost segregation model, would it stay that way or would we, we have to revert back to 27 and a half? That's an excellent question. Um, you know, the truth of the matter is, when it comes to policies and, and tax changes, nothing is really clear. Um, that's for sure, until it's actually done. Everything's up for discussion. Obviously, politicians claim all kinds of things when they're um, campaigning, but what actually happens in reality is oftentimes far from the truth. Uh, that doesn't always the case, but 1031 was something that was brought up that that's, you know, potentially going to be knocked away. I've spoken to many uh, accountants, many attorneys, including our, um, we have a 1031 uh, company as well, Madison. So the head of the qualified intermediary uh, of, of that firm, Madison 1031, is one of like the uh, top attorneys in the field. Like he writes, he wrote the questions for the qualified intermediary exam. You know, like he's testified before Congress on multiple occasions. And basically his, his thoughts were that this is never gonna go away because the people that run Congress and, and run the house have a vested interest in keeping these things. I mean, it's a whole industry and there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of advocacy for these types of things. So politics uh, are a little crazy how they work and I don't wanna get into that, but basically what he told us is that it's probably not going away. In terms of cost segregation as well, I mean, depreciation and cost segregation has been around for decades. It's not something new. Uh, the bonus depreciation as is, uh, which allows you to take the entire amount of that accelerated portion in the first year, that was introduced by Trump right during the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in 2017 and is set to start phasing out in, uh, in 2023. So to like then just remove that entirely, I don't think it's going to happen. I think they're just going to wait and, and let it phase out as the plan is. Uh, however, if let's just say theoretically, because you know you never know, if it were if it were to change, whatever you have on the books, that's going to continue. You're not going to have to retroactively change anything that's already there. But um, as far as you know, what I've heard from others that are experts in the field as well, so maybe you know going forward, if they change something, they will give a date that this is going to take effect, and it's going to take effect. You know, going forward, it's not going to take effect uh, retroactively. And, and any and and by the way, any tax reform whatsoever, I mean, regardless of the fact that you have you know House and Congress you know controlled by one party, that that doesn't change the fact that 
legislation takes a long time to uh, to pass. So uh, I, I highly doubt something like that will, will pass very quickly. So Yona, um, this is Mark. So I think I got confused about bonus depreciation and cost segregation. I guess I, I believe are they one in the same or just kind of a little bit different? Yeah, they're one in the same. Um, so what bonus depreciation is, uh, was introduced that once you've done a cost segregation study and you've identified what the faster depreciation in your property is, and you've said certain things depreciate on a five-year schedule, certain things on a seven or 15-year schedule, you have the option, uh, that's what bonus depreciation is, 100% bonus is an option to now take that entire amount in the first year as in lump sum, as opposed to just waiting and putting them on five or seven 15 year schedules. So it's not something different than, uh, than depreciation or cost segregation, it's one and the same. It's just, it's an option within cost segregation. So in some podcasts, they are saying like, hey, I'm gonna buy this 1 million building and then I can use bonus depreciation. But is that assuming that 1 million building is making income because like you just previously said if, if it's not making income there's really no sense to do cost segregation not necessarily i mean you have to realize that real estate is not in a vacuum okay and okay. so rental property income is all lumped together so if you own a bunch of properties or, or you own a, a lot of buildings oh, your yeah. rental income is all lumped together and so your depreciation is also all lumped together and so it may be advantageous if you have a lot of tax liability, you know, to buy a property just for the depreciation, even if you can't, you know, you're not making income from that, there still may be benefit to it. So in a vacuum, if you're just talking about one property and that's all you own, then no, it probably doesn't make sense. But if you have a portfolio and there is reason to use this strategy, then it, it can definitely make sense. Thank you. I had heard that, um, it's beneficial if you if you do achieve real estate professional status. Otherwise, if you own very few properties, it doesn't make sense. Is that correct? That may be correct. Um, and so I'll, I'll just go back to the previous point of making to Mark is that your depreciation is considered a passive deduction. And that goes against your passive income, your rental property income. So it, you know, if you just have one property, you have a couple of properties and the regular depreciation is enough to offset the income from that, which, you know, depending on how much money you're making from them may or may not be true. Uh, but, you know, how much more benefit is there going to be is limited. However, if you are a real estate professional, which you mentioned is a status that allows you to now use any extra deductions, not just against your passive income, but that passive loss can then be used against any active income or ordinary income that you or your spouse may have. That's where this is really, really, really beneficial, right? Because that's, going to allow you, all right, if you have one spouse is a high W-2 earner and the other one is full-time real estate, you can use the extra depreciation from cost seg to offset the W-2 income as well. And so that's like where it's a really big game changer, but you're right. It's, that's why I mentioned earlier to Mark, the first thing is like, let's see, you know, who are you, right? Are you a real estate professional? Does this make sense? How much is your, your property already making, right? What's the income? How much is your uh, regular depreciation already going to offset that? Is there enough left over that you need to, you know, cover that? Sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes no. So yeah, there's, it's not all one size fits all. It's definitely not for everyone in every situation. So, you know, let me ask you this. Why is it, has that not been taught more? Because, I mean, you said that, you know, it's been around for so long, but why is it not no more out to investors? Cost segregation in general? Yes. I mean, I've only been doing this for a couple of years. I guess that's why. I don't know. I mean, uh, <laughs> I've, I've been, I've been working nonstop. I've been working nonstop around the clock, uh, you know, telling the world about this. Uh, I think I think you're right. Why the, the most common reason that I get why people don't do cost segregation is they just don't know about it. Now, I mean, that's that's literally the most common, which is surprising to me. But after years of doing this, it's it's still surprising, but you know, I've kind of gotten used to the fact and just do my best to just spread the word as much as possible and educate people. Because like you said, there are scenarios where it makes sense. There are some where it doesn't make sense. And there's a lot of like everything out there. There's a lot of misinformation. 
and you got to do your own education. And the most important thing is, is that you got to take the education into your own hands and not rely on your accountant necessarily to be proactive to tell you about this stuff. Because unfortunately, unless you actually have a real estate tax advisor, your accountant is probably not going to be proactive to tell you about this. I mean, show of hands over here, or maybe put it in the chat box. Like, did your, if you own properties, did your accountant like tell you about cost segregation or did you have to like approach them about it? Like, you know, like that's really, I'd like to know because it, this is what I found. I've done webinars. You know, I, I used to give um, CPE credit uh, classes. So that's, you know, for, for continued education for accountants in order to keep their, de you know, their uh, license, they need to have continued education every year, a certain number of hours, you know, have to attend classes and get credits, et cetera. So I've given like dozens of these, of these classes to CPAs. Okay. And I always give, uh, whenever I do that, I'll do like a poll on the Zoom or on the webinar, uh, a poll at the beginning, just to know who these CPAs are, right? What's their knowledge already? How deep do we need to go? You know, et cetera. We're going into literal tax law. Like what, what's the, and my, it, literally it's, it's one through four. It's like, um, how, what's your knowledge of cost segregation? Zero, like I've never know nothing, right? Is one, like second is I've heard of it, but don't know much about it, right? Three is uh, I'm aware, but want to learn more, you know? And, and the fourth is, you know, I'm an expert. I know everything there is to know and just, you know, taking the class for, to get the credits, um, you know? And surprisingly, the vast majority uh, of the CPAs were in the first two categories almost all the time. Either they they never heard of it, or you know it's the first time hearing of it, or they've heard of it but don't know anything about it. And so obviously you have a smaller percentage that do know a lot about it, and that's great. But uh, so CPAs in general, it's not necessarily something that's if they're not really deeply involved in real estate, then they they just won't know it. So I have a lot of people that have accountant, and they got there. Why do you have this account? Because my father used this accountant, or my uncle, or whatever, and I, they're just doing my taxes. Are they proactive? Usually the answer is not. You, you know, that's a good point because I think a lot of times in real estate, you think you know everything, but there's so many nuances to learn about real estate. And, and hearing, hearing, just hearing you present this and talk about this and answer everybody's question, uh, just thank you so much for the for being back. I'm not, I'm not done with the QA session, but man, it's a lot of different things that you just learn by by having these meetups and things like that. I'm off, we'll get to you in a minute, but it's just crazy. Just, you think you know everything you think, but like you said, you had to really know these stuff because people are not going to tell you outright unless you are educated, educating yourself first. And then when you present it, oh, okay, well I'll do it. But a lot of times people just want to get past. Oh, okay, you know, whatever. If, if you don't know, you don't know. So, and that's me. So right, it's very informative. Mark, please ask your question, sir. Appreciate it. Um, Yona, quick question. So I spoke with um, I guess somebody within your network who um who made a statement that as um as a multifamily investor, you can bake the cost seg into a underwriting model from from the beginning to show the investor that you're raising money for how they're gonna get their money faster and save more on taxes. Can you expand on that if if that question makes any sense? Yeah, it's I mean it definitely makes sense. It's a little difficult to do because depreciation, right, is a tax benefit. And so each individual investor is going to have a different tax scenario. They're going to have a different tax rate. But essentially what it is doing is showing you, you can, like you said, put it into your underwriting model, showing the cash flow. Um, and so again, it is a more difficult thing depending on how your underwriting model is working or you're showing cash flow, because if you can show you're going to be getting X amount of um, of return on your investment, on your income each year. And then you're also going to be getting X amount of depreciation, which is going to offset that according to your percentage of ownership. So then you can be showing these people that, or the investors that you're going to be getting, you know, let's say $10,000 in income. And instead of having, you know, only $5,000 of depreciation and pay tax on the remaining 5,000, you can get $10,000 or 20,000, et cetera, of that income, of that depreciation. So essentially you can show and like I said, this is part of why we run these free analysis beforehand because we can show how much the property is going to get. And then you can kind of, based on your investors' um, percentage of ownership and their equity, you can then go ahead and show them each individually if you own X amount of shares, so then you'll be getting X amount of, of depreciation per your investment. And that's usually going to be a lot more 
than, especially if you do the bonus depreciation, a lot more than your actual income. So yeah, it definitely can be done. Not, uh, but again, it it's going to be different for everyone. Thank you. Uh, so when you're doing the analysis for a, someone who's underwriting a property, um, how, how would that be done? And what information do you need to help that process along? Yeah, it's, it's a pretty straightforward uh, process. Like I said, our engineers do this, um, you know, day in, day out. What we need is some basic information. Uh, usually, usually we can gather a lot of it just from having the address of the property because we have data sources that can tell us, you know, how many square footage it is, how many units there are, what's the unit breakdown, year of the property, you know, build, et cetera. But all those things we'll need. Uh, the purchase price and then the uh, the closing date, all those, those uh, you know, pieces of information will allow us to then uh, give an analysis based on, without actually going to the property, just based on our, um, you know, thousands, you know, tens of thousands of properties that we've done in the past similar, we can use that data and say, okay, it's probably going to be minimally like this. We'll give you a conservative estimate up front. So, so if it includes a renovation, that, that would also be put, inputted into your calculations? We can do that as well. Yeah. If, if for example, you, you gave us uh, a construction budget up front, we could then, you know, figure out, break that down and show you how much of that construction budget would break down into those different categories. Okay. That's amazing. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Hey, Yona, I've, I've got a question. Um, I always learn something from you on this. If you are purchasing a property and you have different phases of the updates, rehabs, and it, this is an ongoing process, when would it be best to attack the cost seg? Um, beginning, before, after, or in different phases? How, how would that roll in? So let's say a, a one or maybe a three year process as you're improving the, the facility. That's a great question. It, it can be done in stages. And I would say it's really going to depend. Like I mentioned before, I don't know if you were on the call at that point, Eric, but um, when you're doing the renovations, that's going to be um, new money that's added to your basis that you can depreciate, but it's going to be a uh, starter or placed in service starting at a different time. So if you're ongoing res renovations, you may pick like certain periods of time and do it like once a year to kind of just update that um, to, so that that next year's taxes will be in line with the capital improvements that have taken place during that year. Uh, so it's definitely something that can be done like kind of each year as an update uh, as those things are, are going forward. Um, but yeah. Any more questions from Mr. Yona Weiss, you know, group for I will set maybe maybe two more questions for us at the, at the uh, eight o'clock hour. Yeah, so you know, I'm, I'm just kind of looking at your website. What's the invest portion of your company? I guess. Oh, so you're on yonawice.com. Yeah. So. Uh, that, yeah, that's my homepage. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, that's so. So I work for a company called Madison Specs. We're the biggest national company that does cost segregation. Yonawice.com is more of my personal brand, which involves other things that I do as well, uh, besides for the cost seg. So the invest with us is not, um, has nothing to do with Madison. That's to do with me personally. Like I, I also invest in, you know, just kind of building out that, uh, at this point, I don't have any current deals, but, uh, you know, if and when that will happen, you know, some will go live. But that's not... Uh, just is that credit or not credit? Um, so at this point, uh, at this point, it can even be not accredited, but because I don't, I don't know you, so if oh if no, I, I'm just asking, yeah, I was just, I was yeah, just yeah, exactly. So I'm saying until I actually have a, a project that comes live, it's it's really kind of irrelevant. What's been the biggest challenge that you've seen uh, on an asset class with cost segregation? Uh, is there one to say that's been one of the most challenging or, or can you name a few or, or even just in that, in your experience? Um, you know, from an engineering perspective, there are some that, that can be extremely challenging. I would say the most challenging projects we have is where we don't have 
enough information. <laughs> when people keep coming back with like, oh yeah, we actually did this update or we did this project or, or whatever, and just trying to get all the information and then come back and say, oh, by the way, this was a 1031 exchange. And, and by the way, this is a tick. And, uh, you know, so it's obviously the most challenging things are the ones where you uh, are just kind of working backwards, right? Pounding backwards. But in terms of the actual projects themselves, um, some of the most creative ones are when there's kind of multi-use properties. Um, so not like a mixed use where, you know, it's just retail on the bottom and, and residential on top. You have tons of those all over the place, but where it's literally like, like a multi-use property. So for example, we did one uh, a couple of years ago. It was like a hotel resort, um, but there was also a golf course on it. And there's also, you know, like a banquet hall, uh, all separate properties. And there's also uh, a vineyard on the property, right? So like, it's really a lot of different things. And each um, kind of property is on a different, it's its own asset, really, even within one purchase, but it's its own asset. So some of those are really kind of the most creative, uh, where it really takes a lot more work. But um, but we've done we've done everything. I mean, we it's it's incredible to see like skyscrapers. We do those kind of projects where you're like, <laughs> you know, the engineers working for like like three weeks straight, just like touring the building. Um, that, that's those are those are a lot of fun. Awesome, thank you. Uh, I want to say this to. Um... Today was an eventful day. Um, so um, earlier today, uh, I think Claudia, Claudia was on there, Ellison was on there. We had a uh, homeless vets talk um, on Zoom. And uh, it was a lot of great information uh, talked about by our panel. So if anybody wants to see the replay, please go to my uh, YouTube page. Um, and uh, I, put, I put a post out there on LinkedIn and Facebook. This, this meetup itself will be on YouTube, uh, follow in the next, I guess, hour or so. So if anybody wants to see Yona's teachings, this Q&A session with Yona, uh, please go to my, to my YouTube page and watch the whole replay. It's a lot of great information. Thank you, Yona. Um, does anybody have one more question for Yona before we, uh, before we go to roll call? Going once, going twice. Okay, thank you, Yona. Um, man, great presentation, man. Great, great. Um, thank you for uh, coming on here and, and blessing us with your knowledge. Um, and uh, you are free to come to breakout rooms if you want to. Um, I go to what we call roll call. After roll call, we will go to breakout rooms. And then something you learned last night, we have the after party. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, a lot of times my man Eric runs the after party. Uh, and we we just talk all things real estate and uh, really just try to help each other out. So um, let me just go to roll call real quick. Uh, roll call is when I just talk about different uh, real estate entities that people get into to help them in their in their journey. Um, so let me start with the military. Um, attribute and passive income, great great real site. Um, military affiliated. Um, they have a podcast. They have a uh, multi-family. Um, uh, academy that you can attend every semi-annually. Um, great information. Those guys, they do a really good job. Um, Bill Allen in his seven-figure flippy. Uh, matter of fact, Bill has a really creative uh, uh, um, for capital raises. It's called a 500, what is it, 30-day 500K challenge. A lot of great information that Bill uh, gives. So uh, look up seven-figure flippy with Bill Allen. Uh, White Feathers is another organization uh, based out of California, but military affiliated. Um, so, you know, look up White Feathers. Um, for civilians, uh, Bigger Pockets. You know, Bigger Pockets has so much information. Thank you, Yona, so much, man, for attending. Uh, yeah, thank you. I was just waving. I'm a, I'm a civilian here. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Uh, Bigger Pockets has so much information. Uh, please sign up for it. Uh, a lot of free information. Uh, a lot of good networking on there. A lot of different different podcasts you can attend, uh, from beginners to more advanced business. Um, they have a business one as well, podcast. Um, but with Jay Scott and those guys, I know Jay personally. So uh, go to Bigger Pockets. Um, let's see, uh, Ring. Um, I'm a part of Ring. 
uh, and Ellison is too, and uh, Mark is too. And, and we have chapters um, in, let's see, we have chapters in Washington, New York, LA, St. Louis, Fayetteville, North Carolina, and Raleigh, North Carolina. And uh, we're really doing some big things. Uh, and um, please, you know, please join if you are uh, interested in doing fixing, flipping, wholesaling, things like that. Of course, uh, me and Mark, who just got off, we're part of the GOB network. Um, Mr. Jim Biggs. Um, there's over 200 um, commercial um, real estate investors part of it. It's a lot of great information that Jim has that Jim has started for us. Uh, and it, it, a lot of meetings throughout the week. Um, if you guys are interested in the GOB network, please uh, contact me afterwards. A lot, a lot of great information. Uh, my, uh, if you go to my website, all um, a l l i n h s dot com, all in homes, you'll see I am affiliate of the GOB network and Ring. And finally, uh, make make real estate real with uh, Jamal King. It's a one thousand dollar course, but a lot of great information that goes. Uh, from A to Z on real estate investing. Um, you want to see, uh, just go to make, make real estate real, uh, dot com. Great information on there. Okay, so, um, and one more thing. REI Rocks Conference with our friend, Angel Williams. I did a uh, interview today with Angel. So I am personally invested in, um, the Angel does a really good job of her conference. She put a lot of hard work in it. So REI rocks. Um, I put a post out already. I'll put another post out it. Please, please, please attend, support our friend Angel. She's put a lot of hard work in, in um, interviewing people and everything that goes on for conference. I've seen a lot of behind the scenes and, and doing conferences is a lot of work. So support Angel, support me, um, and uh, sign up and go to the REI rocks conference. Okay, so um, 